only count five of us board members at the moment. So um, we can uh, launch in and um, if we uh, if we cross the, the quorum line at some point, would you mind if I called to order? I, I don't mind at all. And I, yeah, okay. I just talked to Carrie and he's logging in right now. So we are all set. Great. And I have a question about that because it's a forum. It's not a board yeah. meeting. So I don't think we call to order, do we? We're just doing a presentation. We aren't making any decisions. No, that's true. Um, it's just that when we when we reach that critical mass, um, I, I I don't know if there's a parliamentarian in the house, but yeah, so, um, so it's okay. That's the way that we uh, we posted it. Our meeting starting at five, uh, mm -hmm. and then we were gonna use part of it. So it's okay. We'll go ahead and call okay. it to order. I think would okay. be the easiest. <clears throat> Good. All right. Thanks. Are you all set? Should I get started? <laughs> Sorry. We just, okay. Carrie just got here. So he's, he's getting logging in right now. Oh, perfect. Okay, so I'll, I'll get started. And thank you, Jim, for, and just leave us on that first slide for right now. It, back to the picture, sorry. <laughs> okay, so welcome to our community budget forum. Uh, first, I, again, would like to thank, uh, start by thanking our amazing Washington Central Unified Union School this team, uh, administrators, teachers, staff, cooks, custodians, bus drivers, and families. Thank you for all. Continue to be the heart of our communities, and thank you for all you're doing for our children during these challenging times. Um, it, we're really grateful for you. This pandemic has brought into focus public attention to children and education. The inequities in our society are now on every community member's mind. Food insecurity, mental health access, healthcare, homelessness, broadband, income inequality, et cetera. Hopefully as a state and as a country, we will continue to prioritize community and common good and let that be the basic, uh, the basic focus of well-being for all our children. Meeting children needs inside and outside of school. A strong public education is the basis of our democracy and the key, and the key to equitable and flourishing communities. With that in mind, we can get started with the budget presentation. Uh, this is the final draft, not final draft, this is the final budget approved by the board. The school board makes decision on behalf, decisions on behalf of the entire community that support the educational needs of each student. Engaging our communities in these conversations helps us make sure that the community voice is at the heart of our decisions. And it also helps us ensure that we're not only working towards equity in our school boards, but also in our communities as a whole. We all want the healthy, we all want healthy communities and families and ensuring that each and every child has what they need to thrive and succeed sets the foundation for long-term outcomes for that child, not just for that child, but also for our communities. And uh, we can move to the next slide, uh, Jim, thank you. Uh, good. Good budgets don't happen by accident. Planning and collaboration are key components of drafting budgets that are also, that are not just, uh, that are grounded and driven by data. Sorry, I'm trying to turn this right on my notes. Uh, this budget it meets the needs of students, research programs that meet the needs of all students and right sizes school personnel through early retirement, reassignments and minimal staff reductions and reduces expenses and supply. For budget purposes today, uh, equity is a school culture that supports educators in practicing effective and responsive instruction that meets the needs of the whole child. For example, everyone getting what they need to thrive and master our student outcomes. So you see right in front of you are our student learning outcomes. Student learning outcomes are statements that specify what students will know, be able to do, or be able to demonstrate when they have completed or participated in a program, activity, course, or project. Outcomes are usually expressed as knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values are in alignment with the Vermont educational quality standards. 
the leadership team has continued to work on our proficiency-based learning system uh, with all the specific outcomes, with assessments, and, uh, and working on making it uh, consistent across our schools. We have still work to do, but the end result will be a system that flows from pre-K through graduation. Um, and you can see here, transfer skills are at the heart of what we do too. And you see them here. I'm not gonna read one by one. I'm gonna assume that I see that all our public is joined by video so they can see. As a board, we have the responsibility to lead and make sure that we remove barriers and provide the resources necessary. Last summer, we set three goals as a board. Can we go to the next slide, Jim, please? Improving student achievement building board governance and community engagement. These goals help us stay focused on student learning and on collaboration and on monitoring results. It, the school board objectives for, for the budget that you're about to see was establish a budget that is less than 3% net impact on taxes, find ways to pay for three initiatives, strategic planning, facility director and health instructor using some of the fund balances where they were appropriate and establish a budget that was less than the ex-expending threshold per equalized pupil. And lastly, establish a budget that will move towards supporting a strong multi-tier system of supports across all our schools. And next slide, Jim. We have much to celebrate. We are one of five districts in Vermont to reopen fully for live in-person instruction from grades pre-K to eight. Uh, we created a more robust, more robust and community center remote learning offering for students. Uh, we work to align our instructional approaches for teaching math and literacy, provided all students with increased access to technology. We work to develop our own personal care assistants and behavior interventionists. The school board is committed to the, committed to the strategic planning process for continuous improvement and the creation of assessment plan to track students' academic pro progress. And this last bullet, it is a new bullet uh, because just last week we received confirmation that we were awarded uh, all the grants for our COVID <laughs> reimbursement. So, it, and, and the amount of $4.3 million. So, that's really commendable to all of our staff, especially to the um, uh, Lori, Carla, Virginia, Matt, and probably Carla, Michelle. I'm probably going to forget somebody, but you know who you are. Thank you. Uh, and lastly, before I really let you go, um, uh, you know, we hope that the financial forces that are probably coming to us in the coming year uh, or years won't decimate the education of our kids, but will transform it. We will continue to collaborate and continue to look for opportunities with the superintendent and the leadership team, and we will monitor programs, use findings from the upcoming curriculum evaluation and, and you know, engage our community uh, as we go. Next slide, please. And I will give it to Scott to continue. Thank you so much, Fleur. Um, Fleur gets the words, I get the pictures, um, just more my speed. Uh, welcome all of you. I, I noticed there are a lot of old hands in uh, the audience and I'm thinking many of you have not only seen these slides before, you may well have even delivered them. So um, I'm, I'm really tempted to ask uh, for you to, to actually say it, but uh, instead I'll just breeze through so that there's plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end. But as I think everybody knows, this whole budget formulation process is extremely complicated, both technically and interpersonally. Um, it's a highly political activity, political both within the organization um, as different units are, are jockeying for, for resources and, and trying to express their needs. And outside the organization, of course, it's political when the whole question of how are we going to pay for all this comes up and the question of what the impact on taxes is going to be what the legislature is going to do what the feds are going to do all of that so um that i think you understand very well uh next please 
Right, this is the flow chart. And again, I think very familiar to many of you. Um, in this particular cycle, what is, um, what's unusual is that the board gave our, our um, guidelines, our parameters for developing the budget. And because of information coming in about tax impact, the initial tax estimates, that really changed the, the picture. So the, um, the superintendent and the administration went about actually trying to, um, I don't know, exceed the, um, exceed the standard, I guess, that we had set in terms of um, you know, being, being very thrifty and we're even more thrifty. And this, um, essentially, I believe we draft three was the final budget that came out. Um, so we went through this cycle several times. Um, next slide, please. Yes, this is the, um, this is the picture of, of our uh, demographic decline, as it's referred to. Um, the fall in student enrollment over the past as uh, five years and projected into FY22, the budget year, um, both the actual number of students and the weighted um, pupils, equalized pupils, which is very important for the tax formula for those of you who aren't steeped in all of this. The tax formula starts off with education spending over in, in a fraction, education spending in the numerator, equalized pupils in the denominator. So everything else remaining equal, even if you have no increase in education spending, if equalized pupils go down, which they're doing, then the, that portion of the tax formula increases. So something that we have to take account of and work with. Next, please. Right, um, I get some words. Uh, so this basically puts it, puts the picture into, into words and, um, and rounds out the, the somewhat um, maybe downbeat uh, feel of declining enrollment with um, some of our assets, which I think many of you are also quite aware of um, that we have great people who work for us. We have um, fantastic students, which, I mean, this is crucial to having excellent schools. Um, the students are, are, the, are the heart and soul of the place. And we try to, we try to live up to, um, to their quality, both of them, by offering um, as, as new and interesting and um, cutting edge educational opportunities as we can. And I do believe that is it for me. Okay, uh, good evening folks. Um, my name is Kari Bradley from Callis and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the specifics of how we plan to spend the money next year. So this first chart uh, compares the overall size of the district's expense budget, uh, starting last year on the far left with the four versions that we developed this year. We presented version 1A uh, back in December. That was a level service budget, no changes other than the normal inflationary increases. And since then, you can see that we have been working to reduce the budget um, uh, overall by about 600,000 uh, net and we're actually calling for less spending in the 2021-22 budget than in, our, in the current year. And I'm just, I need to point out at this point that um, expense budget is just one of several factors that will determine next year's tax rate. We'll get back to the other factors in just a moment. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these two pie charts show the breakdown of expenses by major categories for the current year on the left and then next year's proposed, proposed budget on the right. 
the big takeaway here, I think, is that the personnel expense, the wages and salaries and benefits that we pay to our teachers, our support staff and administrators, that really makes up the lion's share of our budget. It's about 70%. Otherwise, we are looking at uh, relatively minor changes in the relative proportions. Uh, one thing I want to highlight here is that the key driver in this year's budget, once again, is medical insurance. Uh, we're facing a 9.5% increase, and uh, that means that this portion of our budget, that wedge, big wedge, just gets a little bit bigger every year. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we're going to take a closer look at next year's proposed budget, focusing on the items that most significantly impact the bottom line. Uh, these are the highlights, so don't try to add up the numbers. They're not going to add up um, exactly. Um, but uh, key takeaway here is that our proposed budget has a net impact of, uh, of a decrease of 1.0% over the current year. Uh, in the first section labeled salary and benefits, this covers the compensation items. We've been able to offset, offset the increases in medical insurance and salary rates in a variety of ways, including by reducing several positions. Um, let me point out that in um, accounting, parentheses mean negative in this section. Um, and um, much of the savings here is uh, accomplished by offering an early retirement option to our employees and then uh, planning not to backfill some of those positions and the openings that were created. So I want to thank, thank um, Brian and, and our administrative team for bringing us this solution back in July. Um, at the same time, I think it's good to point out that there are new positions within this budget, in particular for special educators, along with uh, health instruction that was mentioned early, earlier in our elementary schools, and a new facilities director designed up to free up our principals and our superintendent to focus on improving education. The next section in the middle there is non-compensation items. Uh, this is showing a uh, decrease of 1.4% in that, in that category. Uh, there are many changes, both negative and positive. Rest assured, we've really scrutinized each line and adjusted with an eye towards what's in the best interest overall and long-term. And in the last section label, labeled revenues, I wanna highlight two important points. Uh, one is that we are drawing on our fund balance where it makes sense to. That's the uh, accumulation of, of funds over time. Um, we've built up these reserves over time, uh, and we asked our administration to look at where it would make sense to use those appropriately, in particular for one-time expenses like uh, funding the early retirement program. Uh, you also see that we are projecting a significant reduction in revenue from the tuition that we receive from students who come from other towns to attend our schools. And uh, many of you know that for many years we've benefited from students mainly from Washington, Orange, and Roxbury, uh, primarily attending U32. They have historically contributed a significant amount of revenue to our system, and we are now seeing a decline in those numbers and the number of those students. And we're gonna to need to monitor this trend. It's just another challenge um, that's adding pressure to our budget year over year. So um, I think if um, Chris McVeigh has not shown up, I'm gonna take the next couple slides. Could I get the next slide, please? I mentioned earlier that uh, our expense budget is just one of, fa of the factors that contributes to the tax rate. The other ones are the equalized people count uh, and Scott talked about that and, and the trend there. Uh, there's the property yield amount um, that's set by the legislature. And um, that's we don't have a final number on that until uh, much later in the legislative session. Um, similar the, or actually we do, I'm sorry, uh, correct myself. We do have the yield amount, but not the state tax rate that's set by the legislature. Um, what we will be using in um, uh, their projection. And then there's the common le level of appraisal for each town that is going to vary by town based on appraisal levels uh, versus what the state thinks the value of homes are. So all of these factors come together into computing the actual tax rate. Let's go to the next slide, please. And here is the breakdown um, uh, for each town. And you can see um, that in the second column over from the left, we've got the common level of appraisal. We've got the tax rate in our current year. And then applying everything, we've got the tax rate 
um, in uh, for next year with this proposed budget. And in the right hand side, it's the actual um, uh, impact on taxes. And the good news here is that uh, we are projecting a decrease in tax rates across the board. It ranges from the least amount of decrease would be in Middlesex, where we're looking at uh, 1.7 cents. And I believe the high is in Berlin, where we're talking about a decrease of uh, 15 and a half cents. And so this is uh, this is significant. This is the first time I've ever seen this kind, these kind of decreases across the board. And I really want to um, thank the entire team, which includes um, um, Brian and Lori and, and the staff, the administrators, uh, principals, and, and, and the school board and the finance committee. I think it was an, um, an amazing team effort and I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing your feedback. Uh, what's the next slide, please? I guess that's it for me. I'm gonna turn it back over to floor. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, everybody. So as we, you know, as you as you can see, we we did a lot of work in finance uh, this year. And the other thing that we forgot to mention is this is just our second budget. So we're really proud of this, this is our second budget as a unified district. So um, there's a lot to be proud of. Um, we have three questions for you as we open it up for the public. What clarifying questions do you have? Uh, what information will help you support this proposed you know, not proposed budget that has been approved by the board. And uh, and what ideas do you have for informing the community members about this budget? It, we unfortunately got the numbers a little bit uh, later from the state. So we updated the budget that was before posted on uh, on the websites, showed the, it showed increasing the taxes in some in some uh, for some communities, but we actually have the final number, so it's a decrease for every for everybody. So we do need help. Some of our town uh, clerks have posted all the information, but our uh, school reports didn't go out until yesterday. So rest assured that you'll get the information at home, and and you know please remember to vote. So with that. Uh, what clarifying questions do you have? Just open it up. Do you want to monitor this, uh, Scott, or do you want me to do it? Um, you're doing great, Flo. Do you want okay. to continue? Sh sure. I don't see, and maybe somebody. I don't. I don't see hands up yet. <laughs> so if somebody, um, and I, and I, and we don't get to see with the with everybody's um, with the presentation, we don't get to see everybody, so. No, that's that's true. Um, so I don't see any hands up unless if somebody wanna, you know, just unmute. Oh, Scott, I see your, Scott Hess, please yeah, go I, ahead. Just a quick question. I know it's, it's a statewide crisis, but do you have long range plans to address the decrease in enrollment that we're all facing? I know it's huge pressure on budget and state, but, um, What's the thought process process on if it continues to go, um, you know, less enrollment every year? I, you know, I, I think there's a lot of, I, I think we would have to see what opportunities are there to provide, concentrating what would be best outcomes for kids. So if we continue to see, a, you know, a decrease in population, we would have to figure out, you know, are we structured the best way we need to, we're, I restructure the best way to serve the student needs. So, so at, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, what can we afford to, to give the best opportunities and outcomes to our kids? And I think that Scott and Carrie both have some. Uh, yeah, I also, I just also want to thank, thank you all. You do a tremendous job. And I know serving, <laughs> serving on school boards could be the most thankless job, but thank you so much, all of you, for your, for your, for your hard work. Thank you, Scott. Um, we appreciate it. it amen. Scott or um, I, I'll defer to Kari and go after her. If, um... I was just going to um, point out that um, one strategy that would is uh, potentially less painful um, in terms of right sizing is to is to try to attract more students into the system. So that there's a marketing element. Um, and of course that's limited because we're talking about an overall trend, trend in the state. 
but where there's opportunity to attract uh, to attract the students from uh, neighboring towns or even within our towns if they're being homeschooled or, or going off to other places. I know uh, Brian has identified that as a strategy. And then, uh, th then the obvious is um, you're, you're left with the challenge of how do you right size the system for the number of students you have? And it's not happening in an orderly way. It can happen in, you know, in um, fits and starts and at different grade levels. But I think that we don't want to approach it from a scarcity mindset. We want to think about how can we actually improve our education as we're right-sizing the system. That's a, that's a huge challenge. Um, and I think something that when we start the strategic planning process that we have in mind next fall, I think that's going to be near the forefront. Yeah, um, just a second what Kari is saying, it's very definitely a um, you know, a long range strategic discussion. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a great question and it's much on our minds. The, um, the whole problem with demographic decline is that um, it, it's not necessarily something that we're just passively, um, you know, trying to reckon with. We may also be able to do things that will help turn it around because it, um, it's not as though, you know, we're doomed to extinction in, as Vermonters, but that um, if, uh, if as a society, we're able to create the conditions for, um, for families to not only to want to, but to be able to have uh, children, the children that they, that they wish to have, then um, I think we can, we can probably help the whole, the whole social system attain uh, a kind of equilibrium. But this is part of, um, this is one of those discussions that I think all of us are looking forward to having as opposed to having to worry about the pandemic. Diane, do you have something to add to? Yes, and actually Scott was getting at it. Basically, you know, our schools are a microcosm of our communities and so, our decreasing number is also a comment about our affordable housing opportunities are about our ability for families to um, connect and engage in the work that is so important for them and their families. So again, it is that broader question of, of as Kari was saying, how do we create a system that's just right while helping our students gain and um, grow but it's also about how do we help our community to stabilize and be strong and able to provide for the needs that we all have within our, our world. And, and I guess the last thing I would add is that as a state, there's a lot of work being done to try to diversify our state and make it more sustainable for the BIPOC community to move up to Vermont. And there's been you know, stimulus uh, money to try to get people to, to move up to Vermont. And the demographics for, you know, Vermont continues to be the second whitest state in the, in the nation. And the demographics for Vermont, uh, the population that is growing, the younger, we are, everybody's over 65. It is the growest, biggest growing population in Vermont is over 65, except for the BIPOC population, who they are that uh, for 2050, they are gonna double. So, so that's something to keep in, keep in mind too, as we make our communities more sustainable and attractive for, for, for a diverse population in Vermont that will benefit our entire uh, state. Hey, Alan, I see you on mute. On mute. Do you have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I should not, I'm not on mute, I don't think. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, just first a quick comment. I think the single most important thing we could all do to help our schools or, and this area generally is to support the build out of high speed internet in all of our towns. I think that is probably the most important impediment to uh, any sort of um, uh, renewal of the population pool uh, and getting more people into the schools. I, I think that's, that, that just cannot be understated. The questions I have, the first one, uh, I wanted to know the, the 4.3 million in COVID funds that Kari mentioned a few moments ago, is that baked into the projected tax rates 
that floor you were you gave uh, about ten minutes ago? So uh, yeah, I think we switched it. I uh, Lori's in the call with us too, but that is not so. We were able to take those uh, those out. That that's not reflected in our. In, in this budget that you're seeing right now. So we, I'm gonna let Lori speak a little bit about those and we're gonna go into detail on those in our uh, meeting, in our school board meeting too. But uh, Lori, do you mind taking? Sure. Um, right, um, the COVID and the CARES relief money was to reimburse schools for expenses that were incurred last spring and this fall um, that were not in the budget. In addition to that, it was to support food programs, uh, daycares, um, and our regular remote instructions. And the third part of that that you'll hear later is that the uh, good considerable amount of the money was used to uh, repurpose staff that would then return funds to the education fund, which is what has helped with the uh, tax rate reduction because the yield that the state is using assumes that schools will repurpose staff so that the state will have additional funds in their education spending um, budget. So Lori, it, it, could you tell me what, what, is, what is in the budget related to COVID? Are both expenses and reimbursement from either the state or the feds included or is it just the expenses? There are neither expenses nor revenues in next year's budget with regard to COVID. We have budgeted to have school and have business as usual next year. So does that mean the 4.3 million that Kari mentioned has no impact on either the budget or the tax rate? True. Thank True. you. The next question I had was about the fund balance. The fund balance, if you look on page 23, was at uh, 1.9 million in 2020. And in the 2022 budget, it's at $144,000. Has that much money really been taken from the fund balance? Or am I missing something about the way the accounting has been done here? Did you want me to answer that floor or were you going to answer it? Yeah, I, I have it here. So the, that, that is not, I don't know where, it, the, what we have right now. Just go opening my finance notes that I was reserving for after the. So right now we are showing a one, a one point two one million two hundred and eighty seven thousand dollars in um, for for fund balance, and that would include a, us making a fund balance transfer to capital. So I, I'm curious, in what page are you on, Alan? Um, page twenty three, uh, under it's in the top. Um, Top block. So the, the three things that we use the, the, that I'm remembering right now, the three things that we use fund balance for this year were for early retirement, for getting two health educators in it, to have equity around our schools, and for hiring um, a facilities director. But other than that, Lori, unless I'm missing something, or Carrie mm -hmm. or Scott, or um, well, one of the things in. that happened. Um, I can speak to that, Alan, was that when we became a newly merged entity last year, all of the fund balances transferred in together. And those fund balances ha have yet to be reserved for capital funds, et cetera. And that is the action that the board is considering tonight. The board did increase um, the budget revenue by 144,000 for um, the early retirement payments that are due next year. So they were trying to use some of the fund balance to re have tax relief for those one-time payments. So you sort of hit on what my third question was. I could not find any uh, line item for a capital fund in, 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 in this budget. Is that because that hasn't been created yet? Um, the fund balance, uh, capital fund balance was created last year by the voters. Um, there is 700 and, um, $25,000, I'm just looking at my notes. Yes, there's 725,000 as a transfer in for this year. Um, and if you think about the fund balance transfers in the past, um, that is not enough to sustain the capital fund. So the board is considering tonight um, moving the transfer in um, to the capital fund. Okay, I'm, I'm, I won't belabor the point, but I'm, I'm really having trouble following where these things are because it doesn't seem to be laid out in the budget. 
and that's what I was relying on. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry if my questions don't have the context that it sounds like uh, you folks are dealing with. Um, I can uh, connect with you tomorrow, Alan, if that's okay. I, I, I go through I'll it just, if you have more specific. I'll go online and, and see what I can find on, on the website. Maybe there's another document there other than the booklet that arrived in the mail today, um, the annual report that would help me out. Okay, I just, what, what I'm trying to distinguish, Lori, is I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned because it sounds like there's some one-time money that's being used to keep the tax rate down. And I'm trying to figure out where it's coming from, mm -hmm. how much has been used, um, and what impact that's having on the budget. Because I think we all know what, what spending one-time money eventually leads to. And uh, I, I would be concerned about that, especially as the enrollment appears to be continuing to trend downwards. I mean, that's what drives our per pupil spending up and, and that's what drives the tax rate. So um, I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to get a, a fuller picture of what's, what's going on in terms of movement of money and spending and taxing and so forth. Thanks though, I appreciate your help. Okay, thanks Alan. I think Scott wants to yeah, I, um, if I might, I, I expect Lori will probably follow up on this with um, more detail, but we've actually taken great pains to use one-time money for one-time expenses so as not to create any kind of fiscal cliff of any kind. So that <clears throat> when um, I, essentially we're 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 not it's smooth that the curve is smooth um so that we're not you know going to you know clunk off the um off such a cliff in our next year's budget and find ourselves having to uh, raise taxes significantly in order to cover for the uh, make up for what we did this year we're, we're being very careful not to have that happen but you could understand, Scott, why I might have gotten concerned when I saw a fund balance of 2020 of 1.9 million, and for next year it's 144,000. That's how it appears in the documents, and I, mm -hmm. I worry that when people see that, they're going to think, oh my gosh, these people are spending, I don't know, almost almost two million dollars of money that is mm -hmm. that that is in the bank and and can only be spent once. Um, so it it sounds like it's more. The presentation of the information than it is uh, a fear that 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 this money is being tapped for something and it's and the fund balance is going to disappear after next year. Yeah, no, no, the fund balance is not going to disappear. Rest assured, Alan. But that is really, really good input because it's something that we have. You know, we we deeply have the same beliefs that you were saying. We we do not want to create that and and the fund balance. Like I was saying a few minutes ago, even with the if with the board approves moving it to capital fund, it would still be if you know the projected fund balance is over 1.2 million dollars. And the other thing to consider is that Lori is still working on, on finalizing, a, a, you know, and increasing that fund balance because there were a lot of savings from last year. There were not field trips. There were you know there were different things. So we don't we don't actually have the final number. Uh, quite yet of what that fund balance is, but rest assured that your input has been taken. <laughs> thank and, you. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? It's so exciting to see so many people. We've been doing it for ourselves. <laughs> so, <laughs> Matt, do you have a question? You unmute it yourself. Yeah, I have kind of a, a budget adjacent uh, question, I guess. It's really more um, probably suitable for the agenda of a future school board meeting, probably in March. Um, so I'm happy to take a couple minutes and kind of explain what I mean by that, but I don't want to detract from folks that may have, you know, legitimate questions about the, the budget that you presented. Um, so I don't know if there are other people sort of with hands raised. I can't really see what the queue might look like. I, I don't see any hands up. And I will encourage anybody that is in the second page to speak up if they have, but I don't, I don't see anybody. Does anybody well, else just, see anybody? 
I'll go ahead so and go, comment, go, go commandeer go the, the, yeah. the, the mic for the moment. But uh, so I, I guess I just wanted to raise something up to the board's attention. And again, I'm, what I'm really requesting is maybe uh, hopefully 10 or 15 minutes on the agenda of you know, the school board meeting that will happen after the reorganization. So, you know, maybe March 17th, if that, that works. And I can be in touch with the, the steering committee about that. But, um, but essentially the topic is um, a program that U32 has been piloting for the last uh, two years. So last school year and this school year, uh, which is called the uh, Equity Scholar in Residence uh, Program. And for those of you that may not know about that, um, this was something that was created by virtue of a, a grant uh, that was secured by uh, a nonprofit organization, the Friends of Washington Central Schools, uh, which provided an opportunity to U32 to get a trained and kind of seasoned uh, equity expert uh, stationed in the school uh, on a day-to-day -day basis throughout the school year to do a variety of things like, um, you know, get a sense of where the, the staff may be at and the student body may be at with regard to equity issues and concerns uh, to provide, you know, different kinds of training and mentoring to uh, help out and taking a look at the curriculum and reviewing uh, the extent to which there may be um, any inequity kind of embedded in um, the way that, you know, topics are being handled um, all kinds of different things basically relating to uh, different equity issues. Um, by all reports from everybody who's come into contact with the person, uh, Shelley Vermilia, who's been serving in that capacity, um, it's been incredibly positive for uh, the school system. I've, I've confirmed that with the school administrators. Um, and her work uh, has also caught the attention of uh, leaders in education in the state of Vermont. Uh, so the Vermont Principals Association and the McClure Foundation um, are very excited by this and are working uh, hand in hand with the organization that Shelley is associated with to try to find ways of evaluating this um, more quantitatively, this model, its impact on the school, uh, seeing if it can be replicated elsewhere in Vermont as well as in New England and perhaps um, nationally. So. Uh, perhaps, I, I don't know, maybe board members are aware of this, but it's also possible that somewhat, um, you know, below the radar of the board, U32 has been really pioneering an approach to uh, equity and supporting equity uh, that is really garnering a lot of positive attention um, and could to the point that Kari and, and uh, Flora were making earlier, you know, could be not only of great benefit to the student body uh, that's there now, but also as a sort of marketing and selling point. Um, to many people, but particularly to, to folks um, in the BIPOC and, and uh, minority communities. Um, so that's the, that's the topic. Um, the reason it's sort of somewhat of a budget question is that uh, there is obviously the grants running out. So there is some question as to how or whether this model could be sustained. Um, the groups that are involved are very committed to raising funds uh, to continue the model. I, I'm involved with participating in that, which is why I'm here tonight. Um, but of course, we'd like to come to the board and, and really sort of uh, share with them what's been done and what the outcome has been and, and maybe, um, you know, have a conversation about whether there is um, any kind of commitment the, the school community might be able to make to, um, you know, ensuring this can continue as well. So that's the, that's the long and short of it. And I'm happy to talk more about it if that's of interest. So thanks. Thank you, Matt. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I totally. Yeah, I think we an equity director, not just a U32, I globally is for all our schools. <laughs> so that, that, you know, to me, that should be the model. So yes, you're uh, I think that I, I all of the members of the of our uh, planning agenda planning committee are, are here right now and note has been taken and will find the time in the agenda for you to join us and we'll give you plenty of time to. Yeah, and I, sh I should note that the, um, the director of the organization that Shelley is associated with would also attend the meeting and speak directly to the work that they're doing and, and kind of, uh, you know, sort of how it works and what the, what, the, what the needs are and that kind of thing. So yeah, thanks for the, thanks for the time, appreciate it. Thank you. 
So it's 1740, I mean, 547. So Scott, if you wanna take it back and maybe give people a little break before we start or unless sure. there's no questions. Um, <laughs> we have, um, we have <clears throat> uh, a quorum now. So I can, um, we can come to order at 547 officially. Uh, and, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to, we have to shift gears right away. If, um, if there's anybody out there uh, attending who would like to contribute, I'm, I'm really grateful to, um, to you, Scott Hess, Alan, Matthew, for, um, for speaking up and, and for being here in the first place. I, we were a little bit lonely last time we tried to do this. And um, it's much better like this. And budget adjacent, as far as I'm concerned, is, is beautiful. So um, I, before we go any further, uh, is there anyone else who would like to just say something? Um, it doesn't even have to be about the budget. It can be adjacent, as Matthew so beautifully demonstrated just now. Brian. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, point out in Matthew, I, I, I see your background there with the uh, Chinese uh, symbol back there. So uh, what I understand that Matthew has gone to China several times, uh, as lived in China, and I have gone there several times. And if I recall that correctly, and I could be, I could be wrong, but that uh, air thing behind you uh, is basically a, a, uh, it's a, it's a very, it's a Chinese symbol. It, it means many different things to different folks. I was told uh, it helps with fertility and uh, and uh, childbirth. So uh, it, it may, that might be the solution to improving our uh, student enrollment situation. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I like it. I, I see it there, Matthew. I like it very much. Sure, I'm happy happy to buy into the uh, the superstition there. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, Scott has. I have I have one more question since I have kids that are quite a bit older. Can, can the board give us some perspective on, I mean, how is everybody doing through all this and how are the kids and the teachers and through this crisis, just a little bit of color because we're all so concerned and wrapped up in our own worlds at home. But I, you know, I'm just, you know, we're worried and concerned about how, how our community kids are doing it and teachers, if you could maybe just give a little insight possibly. Yeah, thanks. Um, Brian, I, I think I would defer to you as having the overview. Yeah, I uh, thank you for that uh, that question. I, I think we're doing really well in so many aspects. Uh, our children are in school, uh, 95.5 percent daily attendance rate. I was going to say that in my uh, daily report, uh, my super, superintendent's report. So our children are in school. Uh, there, there is this, uh, a lot of districts that don't have the uh, opportunity to have their children in school like we do. Have um, are you know, experiencing you know, significant challenges with uh, mental health students' mental health and um, the uh, COVID slide is what they're calling it nationally, the uh, number of uh, the, the academic uh, drop in academics. So I, I think we're seeing some of the uh, slide because we were closed prior to uh, the school year. Uh, but I think uh, we're, we're, we're really making some strides. I'm, we're, we're looking at the test data. We're, we're gonna be looking at that uh, more closely in the coming months uh, to make some further decisions about what we need to do for our kids. Uh, but I think our, our children are, you know, are in school. They're doing really well. I think the teachers and staff are, who have been uh, the unsung heroes of this uh, pandemic, uh, especially in our district, are doing are doing well. I think the I think the challenge is uh, they're also really tired. I mean, I think we're really looking forward to this uh, week come this upcoming break that's coming up. Uh, I mean, we're all really tired. Uh, uh, my staff, my administrative team, and leadership team, we've worked weekends. We haven't taken in our vacation, uh, we haven't didn't have a summer break. Uh, it, it's so it's been it's been challenging, uh, but I think uh, it's also been very rewarding. And I think we're going to have one of those situations where we look back uh, one day, and I think we're going to say, you know, we we did we did a heck of a job here at Washington Central. Thank you, Brian. I hope that gives you a sense, Scott. Is yeah. There... Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um. Anybody else who would like to um, to deliver some parting remarks before we maybe take a bit of a breather in advance of the um, of the regular session? Lindy, I can get it to unmute. 
I just like to say um, one silver lining of all of this COVID, because there is one. It's the first time I experienced as an educator in the state of Vermont, not going into February break with every school so sick <laughs> with flu and colds and respiratory diseases. And we don't have the colds because we're masking and we're keeping distance. So for once the schools won't have to be fumigated because of the flu going around the schools for the COVID cleanup, yes. So there, there's one little silver lining. We'll take all the silver linings we can get. Uh, sorry, Flora, did you have something? Uh, just to remind people that we will be having a March 1st <laughs> presentation of the budget, an informational meeting too. So before we leave and March 2nd, again, is town meeting, please vote. <laughs> And uh, hopefully everybody, you know, uh, every single town uh, agree to send ballots to all of their voting, of, of the voting uh, registered voters. So we're hoping that you have your ballots and be able to, you know, call us if you have any questions, reach out to any of us in the website. There's the phone numbers and emails of everybody, or if you have any questions, reach out to whoever you're more familiar with. So, and thank you for coming today. Amen. Many, many thanks to, to all of you who took the trouble to join us tonight. And you're welcome to stay, of course, but um, I, that, that, I'm not asking you to because that would be a bit much to ask. Uh, in, in any event, if there's no objection, we can recess until 6 p.m. We can pick up again in, um, in regular session. So, Fleur, um, thank you very much for putting it all together, emceeing, thank you. And to the rest of you as well, have a good evening if we don't see you later. For the rest of you, see you at six.